Chapter 9 of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean F. Sawyers. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1, by John Fox. Edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 9. An Account of the Life and Persecutions of Martin Luther. This illustrious German divine and reformer of the church was the son of John Luther and Margaret Ziegler, and born at Eiselben, a town of Saxony, in the county of Mansfield, November 10, 1483. His father's extraction and condition were originally but mean, and his occupation that of a minor. It is probable, however, that by his application and industry he improved the fortunes of his family, as he afterward became a magistrate of rank and dignity. Luther was early initiated into letters, and at the age of thirteen was sent to school at Magdeburg, and thence to Eisenach in Thuringia, where he remained four years, producing the early indications of his future eminence. In 1501 he was sent to the University of Erfurt, where he went through the usual courses of logic and philosophy. When twenty, he took a master's degree, and then lectured on Aristotle's physics, ethics, and other parts of philosophy. Afterward, at the instigation of his parents, he turned himself to the civil law, with a view of advancing himself to the bar, but was diverted from his pursuit by the following accident. Walking out into the fields one day, he was struck by lightning so as to fall to the ground, while a companion was killed by his side. And this affected him so sensibly, that without communicating his purpose to any of his friends, he withdrew himself from the world, and retired into the order of the hermits of St. Augustine. Here he employed himself in reading St. Augustine and the schoolmen, but in turning over the leaves of the library, he accidentally found a copy of the Latin Bible, which he had never seen before. This raised his curiosity to a high degree. He read it over very greedily, and was amazed to find what a small portion of the scriptures was rehearsed to the people. He made his profession in the monastery of Erfurt, after he had been a novice one year and he took priest's orders, and celebrated his first Mass in 1507. The year after, he was removed from the convent of Erfurt to the University of Wittenberg. For this university being just founded, nothing was thought more likely to bring it into eminent repute and credit than the authority and presence of a man so celebrated for his great parts and learning as Luther. In this University of Erfurt, there was a certain aged man in the convent of the Augustans, with whom Luther, being then of the same order, a friar Augustine, had conference upon diverse things, especially touching remission of sins, which article the said aged father opened unto Luther, declaring that God's express commandment is that every man should particularly believe his sins to be forgiven him in Christ, and further said that this interpretation was confirmed by St. Bernard. This is the testimony that the Holy Ghost giveth thee in thy heart, saying, Thy sins are forgiven thee. For this is the opinion of the Apostle, that man is freely justified by faith. By these words, Luther was not only strengthened, but was also instructed of the full meaning of St. Paul, who repeateth so many times this sentence, We are justified by faith. And having read the expositions of many upon this place, he then perceived, as well by the discourse of the old man, as by the comfort he received in his spirit, the vanity of those interpretations, which he had read before, of the schoolmen. And so, by little and little, reading and comparing the sayings and examples of the prophets and apostles, with continual invocation of God, and the excitation of faith by force of prayer, he perceived that doctrine most evidently. Thus continued he his study at Erfurt, the space of four years in the convent, of the Augustans. In 1512, seven convents of his order having a quarrel with their vicar general, Luther was chosen to go to Rome to maintain their cause. At Rome he saw the Pope and the court, and had an opportunity of observing also the manners of the clergy, whose hasty, superficial, and impious way of celebrating Mass he has severely noted. As soon as he had adjusted the dispute which was the business of his journey, he returned to Wittenberg and was created Doctor of Divinity at the expense of Friedrich, Elector of Saxony, who had often heard him preach, 
was perfectly acquainted with his merit and reverenced him highly. He continued in the University of Wittenberg, where, as professor of divinity, he employed himself in the business of his calling. Here then he began in the most earnest manner to read the lectures upon the sacred books. He explained the epistle to the Romans, and the Psalms, which he cleared up and illustrated in a manner so entirely new, and so different from what had been pursued by former commentators, that there seemed, after a long and dark night, a new day to arise in the judgment of all pious and prudent men. Luther diligently reduced the minds of men to the Son of God. As John the Baptist demonstrated the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world, even so Luther, shining in the church as the bright daylight after a long and dark night, expressly showed that sins are freely remitted for the love of the Son of God, and that we ought faithfully to embrace this bountiful gift. His life was correspondent to his profession, and it plainly appeared that his words were no lip labor, but proceeded from the very heart. This admiration of his holy life much allured the hearts of his auditors. The better to qualify himself for the task he had undertaken, he had applied himself attentively to the Greek and Hebrew languages, and in this manner was he employed when the general indulgences were published in 1517. Leo X, who succeeded Julius II in March 1513, formed a design of building the magnificent church of St. Peter's at Rome, which was, indeed, begun by Julius, but still required very large sums to be finished. Leo, therefore, in 1517 published general indulgences throughout all Europe, in favor of those who contribute any sum to the building of St. Peter's, and appointed persons in different countries to preach up these indulgences, and to receive money for them. These strange proceedings gave vast offense at Wittenberg, and particularly inflamed the pious zeal of Luther, who, being naturally warm and active, and in the present case unable to contain himself, was determined to declare against them at all adventures. Upon the eve of all saints, therefore, in 1517, he publicly fixed up, at the church next to the castle of that town, a thesis upon indulgences in the beginning of which he challenged any one to oppose it either by writing or disputation. Luther's propositions about indulgences were no sooner published than Tetzel, the Dominican friar and commissioner for selling them, maintained and published at Frankfurt a thesis containing a set of propositions directly contrary to them. He did more. He stirred up the clergy of his order against Luther, anathematized him from the pulpit as a most damnable heretic, and burnt his thesis publicly at Frankfurt. Tetzel's thesis was also burnt, in return, by the Lutherans at Wittenberg, but Luther himself disowned having had any hand in that procedure. In 1518, Luther, though dissuaded from it by his friends, yet to show obedience to authority, went to the monastery of St. Augustine at Heidelberg, while the chapter was held, and here maintained, April 26, a dispute concerning justification by faith which Bucer, who was present at, took down in writing, and afterward communicated to Betus Renaeus, not without the highest commendations. In the meantime, the zeal of his adversaries grew every day more and more active against him, and he was at length accused to Leo X as a heretic. As soon as he returned, therefore, from Heidelberg, he wrote a letter to that pope in the most submissive terms, and sent him, at the same time, an explication of his propositions about indulgences. This letter is dated on Trinity Sunday, 1518, and was accompanied with a protestation, wherein he declared that he did not pretend to advance or defend anything contrary to the Holy Scriptures, or to the doctrine of the Fathers, received and observed by the Church of Rome, or to the canons and decretals of the Popes. Nevertheless, he thought he had the liberty either to approve or disprove the opinions of St. Thomas, Bonaventura, and other schoolmen and canonists, which are not grounded upon any text. The Emperor Maximilian was equally solicitous with the Pope about putting a stop to the propagation of Luther's opinions in Saxony, troublesome both to the Church and Empire. Maximilian, therefore, applied to Leo in a letter dated August 5, 1518, and begged him to forbid by his authority these useless, rash, and dangerous disputes, assuring him also that he would strictly execute in the empire whatever his holiness should enjoin. In the meantime Luther, 
as soon as he understood what was transacting about him at Rome, used all imaginable means to prevent his being carried thither, and to obtain a hearing of his cause in Germany. The elector was also against Luther's going to Rome, and desired of Cardinal Cajetan that he might be heard before him, as the Pope's legate in Germany. Upon these addresses, the Pope consented that the cause should be tried before Cardinal Cajetan, whom he had given power to decide it. Luther, therefore, set off immediately for Augsburg, and carried with him letters from the elector. He arrived here in October 1518, and, upon an assurance of his safety, was admitted into the cardinal's presence. But Luther was soon convinced that he had more to fear from the cardinal's power than from disputations of any kind, and, therefore, apprehensive of being seized if he did not submit, withdrew from Augsburg upon the 20th. But, before his departure, he published a formal appeal to the Pope, and finding himself protected by the elector, continued to teach the same doctrines at Wittenberg, and sent a challenge to all the inquisitors to come and dispute with him. As to Luther, Miltatius, the Pope's chamberlain, had orders to require the elector to oblige him to retract, or to deny him his protection. But things were not now to be carried with so high a hand, Luther's credit being too firmly established. Besides, the Emperor Maximilian happened to die upon the twelfth of this month, whose death greatly altered the face of affairs, and made the elector more able to determine Luther's fate. Miltatius thought it best, therefore, to try what could be done by fair and gentle means, and to that end came to some conference with Luther. During all these treaties, the doctrine of Luther spread, and prevailed greatly, and he himself received great encouragement at home and abroad. The Bohemians about this time sent him a book of the celebrated John Hus, who had fallen a martyr in the work of Reformation, and also letters in which they exhorted him to constancy and perseverance, owing that the divinity which he taught was the pure, sound, and orthodox divinity. Many great and learned men had joined themselves to him. In 1519 he had a famous dispute at Leipzig with John Achaius, but this dispute ended at length like all others, the parties not the least nearer in opinion, but more at enmity with each other's persons. About the end of this year, Luther published a book, in which he contended for the communion being celebrated in both kinds, which was condemned by the bishop of Messenia, January 24, 1520. While Luther was laboring to excuse himself to the new emperor and the bishops of Germany, Achaius had gone to Rome, to solicit his condemnation, which, it may be easily conceived, was now become not difficult to be attained. Indeed, the continual importunities of Luther's adversaries with Leo caused him at length to publish a formal condemnation of him, and he did so accordingly in a bull dated June 15, 1520. This was carried into Germany, and published there by Achaius, who had solicited it at Rome, and who, together with Jerome Alexander, a person eminent for his learning and eloquence, was entrusted by the Pope with the execution of it. In the meantime, Charles V of Spain, after he had set things to rights in the Low Countries, went into Germany and was crowned Emperor, October the 21st, at Aix la Chapelle. Martin Luther, after he had been first accused at Rome upon Monday Thursday by the Pope's censure, shortly after Easter speedeth his journey toward Worms where the said Luther, appearing before the emperor in all the states of Germany, constantly stuck to the truth, defended himself, and answered his adversaries. Luther was lodged, well entertained, and visited by many earls, barons, knights of the order, gentlemen, priests, and the commonalty, who frequented his lodging until night. He came, contrary to the expectation of many, as well adversaries as others. His friends deliberated together, and many persuaded him not to adventure himself to such a present danger, considering how these beginnings answered not the faith of promise made, who, when he had heard their whole persuasion and advice, answered in this wise, As touching me, since I am sent for, I am resolved and certainly determined to enter Worms, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yea, although I knew there were as many devils to resist me as there are tiles to cover the houses in Worms. The next day, 
the herald brought him from his lodging to the emperor's court, where he abode until six o'clock, for that the princes were occupied in grave consultations. Abiding there, and being environed with a great number of people, and almost smothered for the press that was there. Then after, when the princes were set, and Luther entered, Achaius, the official, spake in this manner. Answer now to the emperor's demand. Wilt thou maintain all thy books which thou hast acknowledged, or revoke any part of them, and submit thyself? Martin Luther answered modestly and lowly, and yet not without some stoutness of stomach and Christian constancy. Considering your sovereign majesty, and your honors require a plain answer, this I say and profess, as resolutely as I may, without doubting or sophistication, that if I be not convinced by testimonies of the scriptures, for I believe not the Pope, neither his general councils, which have erred many times, and have been contrary to themselves, my conscience is so bound and captivated in these scriptures and the word of God, that I will not nor may not revoke any manner of thing, considering it is not godly or lawful to do anything against conscience. Hereupon I stand and rest. I have not what else to say. God have mercy upon me. The princes consulted together upon this answer given by Luther, and when they had diligently examined the same, the prolocutor began to repel him thus. The Emperor's Majesty requireth of thee a simple answer, either negative or affirmative, whether thou mindest to defend all thy works as Christian or no. Then Luther, turning to the Emperor and the nobles, besought them not to force or compel him to yield against his conscience, confirmed with the Holy Scriptures, without manifest arguments alleged to the contrary by his adversaries. I am tied by the Scriptures. Before the Diet of Worms was dissolved, Charles V caused an edict to be drawn up, which was dated the 8th of May, and decreed that Martin Luther be, agreeably to the sentence of the Pope, henceforward looked upon as a member separated from the Church, a schismatic and an obstinate and notorious heretic, while the bull of Leo X executed by Charles V was thundering throughout the empire, Luther was safely shut up in the castle of Wittenberg but weary at length of his retirement, he appeared publicly again at Wittenberg, March 6, 1522, after he had been absent about ten months. Luther now made open war with the Pope and bishops, and, that he might make the people despise their authority as much as possible, he wrote one book against the Pope's bull, and another against the order falsely called the Order of Bishops. He published also a translation of the New Testament in the German tongue, which was afterward corrected by himself and Melanchthon. Affairs were now in great confusion in Germany, and they were not less so in Italy, for a quarrel arose between the Pope and the Emperor, during which Rome was twice taken and the Pope imprisoned. While the princes were thus employed in quarreling with each other, Luther persisted in carrying on the work of the Reformation, as well by opposing the Papists as by combating the Anabaptists and other fanatical sects, which having taken the advantage of his conquest with the Church of Rome, had sprung up and established themselves in several places. In 1527, Luther was suddenly seized with a coagulation of the blood about the heart, which had liked to have put an end to his life. The troubles of Germany being not likely to have any end, the emperor was forced to call a deet at Spires in 1529 to require the assistance of the princes of the empire against the Turks. Fourteen cities, viz. Strasbourg, Nuremberg, Ulm, Constance, Rettlingen, Winsheim, Memmingen, Lindo, Kempton, Hallebron, Isny, Weissenberg, Nortlingen, and S. Gaul, joined against the decree of the Diet protestation, which was put into writing and published April 1529. This was the famous protestation which gave the name of Protestants to the reformers in Germany. After this, the Protestant princes labored to make a firm league and enjoined in the elector of Saxony and his allies to approve of what the Diet had done. But the deputies drew up an appeal, and the Protestants afterwards presented an apology for their confession, that famous confession which was drawn up by the temperate Melanchthon, as also the apology. These were signed by a variety of princes, 
and Luther had now nothing else to do but to sit down and contemplate the mighty work he had finished, for that a single monk should be able to give the Church of Rome so rude a shock that there needed but such another entirely to overthrow it, may be well esteemed a mighty work. In 1533, Luther wrote a consolatory epistle to the citizens of Oschatz, who had suffered some hardships for adhering to the Augsburg Confession of Faith, and in 1534 the Bible translated by him into German was first printed, as the old privilege, dated at Bibliopolis, under the elector's own hand, shows, and it was published in the year after. He also published this year a book, Against Masses and the Consecration of Priests. In February, 1537, an assembly was held at Smallcald about matters of religion to which Luther and Melanchthon were called. At this meeting Luther was seized with so grievous an illness that there was no hope of his recovery. As he was carried along he made his will, in which he bequeathed his detestation of popery to his friends and brethren. In this manner he was employed until his death, which happened in 1546. That year, accompanied by Melanchthon, he paid a visit to his own country, which he had not seen for many years, and returned again in safety. But soon after, he was called thither again by the earls of Manfeld, to compose some differences which had arisen about their boundaries, where he was received by one hundred horsemen or more, and conducted in a very honorable manner, but was at the same time so very ill that it was feared he would die. He said that these fits of sickness often came upon him when he had any great business to undertake. Of this, however, he did not recover, but died in February 18, in his sixty-third year. A little before he expired, he admonished those that were about him to pray to God for the propagation of the gospel, because, said he, the Council of Trent, which has set once or twice, and the Pope will devise strange things against it. Feeling his fatal hour to approach, before nine o'clock in the morning, he commended himself to God with this devout prayer. My heavenly Father, eternal and merciful God, Thou hast manifested unto me Thy dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. I have taught Him, I have known Him. I love Him as my life, my health, and my redemption, whom the wicked have persecuted, maligned, and with injury afflicted. Draw my soul to Thee. After this he said, as in Sueth, thrice, I commend my spirit into thy hands. Thou hast redeemed me, O God of truth. God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have life everlasting. Having repeated oft times his prayers, he was called to God. So praying, his innocent ghost peaceably was separated from the earthly body. End of chapter 9 Recording by Sean F. Sawyers, O'Fallon, Missouri Chapter 10 of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1, by John Fox, edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 10, General Persecutions in Germany. The general persecutions in Germany were principally occasioned by the doctrines and ministry of Martin Luther. Indeed, the Pope was so terrified at the success of that courageous reformer, that he determined to engage the emperor, Charles V, at any rate, in the scheme to attempt their extirpation. To this end, 1. He gave the emperor 200,000 crowns in ready money. 2. He promised to maintain 12,000 foot and 5,000 horse for the space of six months or during a campaign. 3. He allowed the emperor to receive one-half the revenues of the clergy of the empire during the war. 4. He permitted the emperor to pledge the abbey lands for 500,000 crowns to assist in carrying on hostilities against the Protestants. Thus prompted and supported, the emperor undertook the extirpation of the Protestants, against whom, indeed, he was particularly enraged himself, 
and, for this purpose, a formidable army was raised in Germany, Spain, and Italy. The Protestant princes, in the meantime, formed a powerful confederacy in order to repel the impending blow. A great army was raised, and the command given to the elector of Saxony and the landgrave of Hesse. The imperial forces were commanded by the emperor of Germany in person, and the eyes of all Europe were turned on the event of the war. At length the armies met, and a desperate engagement ensued, in which the Protestants were defeated, and the elector of Saxony and the landgrave of Hesse both taken prisoners. This fatal blow was succeeded by a horrid persecution, the severities of which were such that exile might be deemed a mild fate, and concealment in a dismal wood pass for happiness. In such times a cave is a palace, a rock a bed of down, and wild roots delicacies. Those who were taken experienced the most cruel tortures that infernal imaginations could invent, and by their constancy evinced that a real Christian can surmount every difficulty, and despite every danger acquire a crown of martyrdom. Henry Vose and John Esch, being apprehended as Protestants, were brought to examination. Vose, answering for himself and the other, gave the following answers to some questions asked by a priest, who examined them by order of the magistracy. Priest, were you not both some years ago, Augustine Friars? Vose, yes. Priest, how came you to quit the bosom of the church at Rome? Vose, on account of her abominations. Priest, in what do you believe? Vose, in the Old and New Testaments. Priest, do you believe in the writings of the fathers and the decrees of the councils? Vose, yes, if they agree with scripture. Priest, did not Martin Luther seduce you both? Vose, he seduced us even in the very same manner as Christ seduced the apostles, that is, he made us sensible of the frailty of our bodies and the value of our souls. This examination was sufficient. They were both condemned to the flames, and soon after suffered with that manly fortitude which becomes Christians when they receive a crown of martyrdom. Henry Sutphin, an eloquent and pious preacher, was taken out of his bed in the middle of the night, and compelled to walk barefoot a considerable way, so that his feet were terribly cut. He desired a horse, but his conductors said in derision, A horse for a heretic? No, no, heretics may go barefoot. When he arrived at the place of his destination, he was condemned to be burnt, but, during the execution, many indignities were offered him, as those who attended, not content with what he suffered in the flames, cut and slashed him in a most terrible manner. Many were murdered at Halle, Middleburg being taken by storm, all the Protestants were put to the sword, and great numbers were burned at Vienna. An officer being sent to put a minister to death, pretended, when he came to the clergyman's house, that his intentions were only to pay him a visit. The minister, not suspecting the intended cruelty, entertained his supposed guest in a very cordial manner. As soon as dinner was over, the officer said to some of his attendants, Take this clergyman and hang him. The attendants themselves were so shocked after the civility they had seen that they hesitated to perform the commands of their master. And the minister said, Think what a sting will remain on your conscience for thus violating the laws of hospitality. The officer, however, insisted upon being obeyed, and the attendants, with reluctance, performed the execrable office of executioners. Peter Spengler, a pious divine, of the town of Shallot, was thrown into the river and drowned. Before he was taken to the banks of the stream which was to become his grave, they led him to the market-place that his crimes might be proclaimed, which were, not going to mass, not making confession, and not believing in transubstantiation. After this ceremony was over, he made a most excellent discourse to the people, and concluded with a kind hymn of a very edifying nature. A Protestant gentleman, being ordered to lose his head for not renouncing his religion, went cheerfully to the place of execution. A friar came to him, and said these words in a low tone of voice, As you have a great reluctance publicly to abjure your faith, whisper your confession in my ear, and I will absolve your sins. To this the gentleman loudly replied, Trouble me not, friar, I have confessed my sins to God, and obtained absolution through the merits of Jesus Christ. Then turning to the executioner, he said, Let me not be pestered with these men, but perform your duty. 
on which his head was struck off at a single blow. Wolfgang Scooch and John Huglin, two worthy ministers, were burned, as was Leonard Kaiser, a student at the University of Württemberg, and George Carpenter, a Bavarian, was hanged for refusing to recant Protestantism. The persecutions in Germany, having subsided many years, again broke out in 1630, on account of the war between the emperor and the king of Sweden, for the latter was a Protestant prince, and consequently the Protestants of Germany espoused his cause, which greatly exasperated the emperor against them. The imperialists, having laid siege to the town of Passawak, which was defended by the Swedes, took it by storm, and committed the most horrid cruelties on the occasion. They pulled down the churches, burnt the houses, pillaged the properties, massacred the ministers, put the garrison to the sword, hanged the townsmen, ravished the women, smothered the children, etc., etc. A most bloody tragedy was transacted at Magdeburg in the year 1631. The generals Tilly and Pappenheim, having taken that Protestant city by storm, upwards of twenty thousand persons, without distinction of rank, sex, or age, were slain during the carnage, and six thousand were drowned in attempting to escape over the river Elbe. After this fury had subsided, the remaining inhabitants were stripped naked, severely scourged, had their ears cropped, and being yoked together like oxen, were turned adrift. The town of Hoxter was taken by the Popish army, and all the inhabitants, as well as the garrison, were put to the sword. The houses even were set on fire, the bodies being consumed in the flames. At Griffenburg, when the imperial forces prevailed, they shut up the senators in the senate chamber, and surrounding it by lighted straw, suffocated them. Frandendal surrendered upon articles of capitulation, yet the inhabitants were as cruelly used as at other places, and at Heidelberg many were shut up in prison and starved. The cruelties used by the imperial troops, under Count Tilly in Saxony, are thus enumerated. Half strangling and recovering the persons again repeatedly. Rolling sharp wheels over the fingers and toes pinching the thumbs in a vice, forcing the most filthy things down the throat by which many were choked, tying cords round the head so tightly that the blood gushed out of the eyes, nose, ears, and mouth, fastening burning matches to the fingers, toes, ears, arms, legs, and even the tongue, putting powder in the mouth and setting fire to it by which the head was shattered to pieces, tying bags of powder to all parts of the body by which the person was blown up, drawing cords backwards and forwards through the fleshy parts, making incisions with bodkins and knives in the skin, running wires through the nose, ears, lips, etc., hanging Protestants up by the legs with their heads over a fire by which they were smoke-dried, hanging up by one arm until it was dislocated, hanging upon hooks by the ribs, forcing people to drink until they burst, baking many in hot ovens, fixing weights to the feet and drying up several with pulleys, hanging, stifling, roasting, stabbing, frying, racking, ravishing, ripping open, breaking the bones, rasping off the flesh, tearing with wild horses, drowning, strangling, burning, broiling, crucifying, immering, poisoning, cutting off tongues, noses, ears, etc., sawing off the limbs, hacking to pieces, and drawing by the heels through the streets. The enormous cruelties will be a perpetual stain on the memory of Count Tilly, who not only committed, but even commanded the troops to put them in practice. Wherever he came, the most horrid barbarities and cruel depredations ensued. Famine and conflagration marked his progress, for he destroyed all the provisions he could not take with him, and burnt all the towns before he left them so that the full result of his conquests were murder, poverty, and desolation. An aged and pious divine they stripped naked, tied him on his back upon a table, and fastened a large, fierce cat upon his belly. They then pricked and tormented the cat in such a manner that the creature with rage tore his belly open and gnawed his bowels. Another minister and his family were seized by these inhuman monsters. They ravished his wife and daughter before his face, stuck his infant son upon the point of a lance, and then surrounding him with his whole library of books, they set fire to them, and he was consumed in the midst of the flames. In Hesse Castle some of the troops entered an hospital, 
in which were principally mad women, when stripping all the poor wretches naked, they made them run about the streets for their diversion, and then put them all to death. In Pomerania, some of the imperial troops entering a small town, seized upon all the young women and girls of upwards of ten years, and then placing their parents in a circle, they ordered them to sing psalms while they ravished their children, or else they swore they would cut them to pieces afterward. They then took all the married women who had young children, and threatened, if they did not consent to the gratification of their lusts, to burn their children before their faces in a large fire which they had kindled for that purpose. A band of Count Tilly's soldiers, meeting a company of merchants belonging to Basil, who were returning from the great market of Strasbourg, attempted to surround them. All escaped, however, but ten, leaving their properties behind. The ten who were taken begged hard for their lives, but the soldiers murdered them, saying, You must die because you are heretics and have got no money. The same soldiers met with two countesses who, together with some young ladies, the daughters of one of them, were taking an airing in a landau. The soldiers spared their lives, but treated them with the greatest indecency, and having stripped them all stark naked, bade the coachman drive on. By means and mediation of Great Britain, peace was at length restored to Germany, and the Protestants remained unmolested for several years, until some new disturbances broke out in the Palatinate, which were thus occasioned. The great church of the Holy Ghost at Heidelberg had, for many years, been shared equally by the Protestants and the Roman Catholics in this manner, the Protestants performed divine service in the nave or body of the church, and the Roman Catholics celebrated Mass in the choir. Though this had been the custom from time immemorial, the elector of the Palatinate, at length, took it into his head not to suffer it any longer, declaring that as Heidelberg was the place of his residence, and the Church of the Holy Ghost the cathedral of his principal city, divine service ought to be reformed only according to the rites of the church of which he was a member. He then forbade the Protestants to enter the church, and put the Papists in possession of the whole. The aggrieved people applied to the Protestant powers for redress, which so much exasperated the elector that he suppressed the Heidelberg Catechism. The Protestant powers, however, unanimously agreed to demand satisfaction, as the elector, by this conduct, had broken an article of the Treaty of Westphalia, and the courts of Great Britain, Prussia, Holland, etc., sent deputies to the elector, to represent the injustice of his proceedings, and to threaten, unless he changed his behavior to the Protestants in the Palatinate, that they would treat their Roman Catholic subjects with the greatest severity. Many violent disputes took place between the Protestant powers and those of the elector, and these were greatly augmented by the following incident. The coach of the Dutch minister standing before the door of the residence sent by the Prince of Hesse, the host was by chance being carried to a sick person, the coachman took not the least notice, which those who attended the host observing, pulled him from his box and compelled him to kneel. This violence to the domestic of a public minister was highly resented by all the Protestant deputies, and still more to heighten these differences, the Protestants presented to the deputies three additional articles of complaint. 1. That military executions were ordered against all Protestant shoemakers who should refuse to contribute to the masses of St. Crispin. 2. That the Protestants were forbid to work on Popish holy days, even in harvest time, under very heavy penalties, which occasioned great inconveniences, and considerably prejudiced public business. 3. That several Protestant ministers had been dispossessed of their churches, under pretense of having been originally founded and built by Roman Catholics. The Protestant deputies at length became so serious as to intimate to the elector, that force of arms should compel him to do the justice he denied to their representations. This menace brought him to reason, as he well knew the impossibility of carrying on a war against the powerful states who threatened him. He therefore agreed that the body of the Church of the Holy Ghost should be restored to the Protestants. He restored the Heidelberg Catechism, put the Protestant ministers again in possession of the churches of which they had been dispossessed, allowed the Protestants to work on Popish Holy Days, and ordered that no person should be molested for not kneeling when the host passed by. These things he did through fear, but to show his resentment to his Protestant subjects, in other circumstances where Protestant states had no right to interfere, he totally abandoned Heidelberg, removing all the courts of justice to Mannheim, which was entirely inhabited by Roman Catholics. 
He likewise built a new palace there, making it his place of residence, and being followed by the Roman Catholics of Heidelberg, Mannheim became a flourishing place. In the meantime, the Protestants of Heidelberg sunk into poverty, and many of them became so distressed as to quit their native country and seek an asylum in Protestant states. A great number of these coming into England in the time of Queen Anne were cordially received there, and met with a most humane assistance both by public and private donations. In 1732, above 30,000 Protestants were, contrary to the Treaty of Westphalia, driven from the Archbishopric of Salzburg. They went away in the depth of winter, with scarcely enough clothes to cover them, and without provisions, not having permission to take anything with them. The cause of these poor people not being publicly espoused by such states as could obtain them redress, they emigrated to various Protestant countries and settled in places where they could enjoy the free exercise of their religion without hurting their consciences and live free from the trammels of popish superstition and the chains of papal tyranny. End of chapter 10 Recording by Tricia G. Of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1 by John Fox, edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 11 An Account of the Persecutions in the Netherlands. The light of the gospel having successfully spread over the Netherlands, the Pope instigated the Emperor to commence a persecution against the Protestants, when many thousand fell martyrs to superstitious malice and barbarous bigotry, among whom the most remarkable were the following. When Della Nuta, a pious Protestant widow, was apprehended on account of her religion, when several monks, unsuccessfully, endeavored to persuade her to recant. As they could not prevail, a Roman Catholic lady of her acquaintance desired to be admitted to the dungeon in which she was confined, and promised to exert herself strenuously towards inducing the prisoner to abjure the reformed religion. When she was admitted into the dungeon, she did her utmost to perform the task she had undertaken, but finding her endeavors ineffectual, she said, Dear Wendella Nuda, if you will not embrace our faith, at least keep the things which you profess secret within your own bosom, and strive to prolong your life. To which the widow replied, Madam, you know not what you say, for with the heart we believe to righteousness, but with the tongue confession is made unto salvation. As she positively refused to recant, her goods were confiscated, and she was condemned to be burnt. At the place of execution a monk held a cross to her, and bade her kiss and worship God to which she answered, I worship no wooden god, but the eternal god who is in heaven. She was then executed, but through the before-mentioned Roman Catholic lady, the favor was granted that she should be strangled before fire was put to the faggots. Two Protestant clergymen were burnt at Colon. A tradesman of Antwerp, named Nicholas, was tied up in a sack, thrown into the river, and drowned. And Pistorius, a learned student, was carried to the market of a Dutch village in a fool's coat and committed to the flames. Sixteen Protestants, having received sentence to be beheaded, a Protestant minister was ordered to attend the execution. This gentleman performed the function of his office with great propriety, exhorted them to repentance, and gave them comfort in the mercies of their Redeemer. As soon as the sixteen were beheaded, the magistrate cried out to the executioner, There is another stroke remaining yet, you must behead the minister. He can never die at a better time and with such excellent precepts in his mouth and such laudable examples before him. He was accordingly beheaded, though even many of the Roman Catholics themselves reparated this piece of treacherous and unnecessary cruelty. George Scherter, a minister of Salzburg, was apprehended and committed to prison for instructing his flock in the knowledge of the gospel. While he was in confinement, he wrote a confession of his faith, soon after which he was condemned, first to be beheaded, and afterward to be burnt to ashes. On his way to the place of execution, he said to the spectators, That you may know I die a true Christian, I will give you a sign. This was indeed verified in a most singular manner, for after his head was cut off, the body lying a short space of time with the belly to the ground, it suddenly turned upon the back, when the right foot crossed over the left, 
as did also the right arm over the left, and in this manner it remained until it was committed to the flames. In Luviana, a learned man named Personal was murdered in prison, and Justice Inspark was beheaded for having Luther's sermons in his possession. Giles Tilleman, a cutler of Brussels, was a man of great humanity and piety. Among others he was apprehended as a Protestant, and many endeavors were made by the monks to persuade him to recant. He had once, by accident, a fair opportunity of escaping from prison, and being asked why he did not avail himself of it, he replied, I would not do the keepers so much injury, as they must have answered for my absence had I gone away. When he was sentenced to be burnt, he fervently thanked God for granting him an opportunity, by martyrdom, to glorify his name. Perceiving at the place of execution a great quantity of faggots, he desired the principal part of them might be given to the poor, saying, A small quantity will suffice to consume me. The executioner offered to strangle him before the fire was lighted, but he would not consent, telling him that he defied the flames, and, indeed, he gave up the ghost with such composure amidst them that he hardly seemed sensible of their effects. In the year 1543 and 1544, the persecution was carried on throughout all Flanders in a most violent and cruel manner. Some were condemned to perpetual imprisonment, others to perpetual banishment, but most were put to death either by hanging, drowning, immering, burning, the rack, or burying alive. John de Boscain, a zealous Protestant, was apprehended on account of his faith in the city of Antwerp. On his trial he steadfastly professed himself to be of the reformed religion, which occasioned his immediate condemnation. The magistrate, however, was afraid to put him to death publicly, as he was popular through his great generosity, and almost university beloved for his inoffensive life and exemplary piety. A private execution being determined on, an order was given to drown him in prison. The executioner, accordingly, put him in a large tub, but Boscain struggling and getting his head above the water, the executioner stabbed him with a dagger in several places until he expired. John de Buissons, another Protestant, was, about the same time, secretly apprehended and privately executed at Antwerp. The numbers of Protestants being great in that city, and the prisoner much respected, the magistrates feared an insurrection, and for that reason ordered him to be beheaded in prison. A.D. 1568, three persons were apprehended in Antwerp, named Scoblant, Hughes, and Cummins. During their confinement they behaved with great fortitude and cheerfulness, confessing that the hand of God appeared in what had befallen them, and bowing down before the throne of his providence. In an epistle to some worthy Protestants, they expressed themselves in the following words, quote, Since it is well of the Almighty that we should suffer for his name, and be persecuted for the sake of his gospel, we patiently submit and are joyful upon the occasion. Though the flesh may rebel against the spirit, and hearken to the counsel of the old serpent, yet the truths of the gospel shall prevent such advice from being taken, and Christ shall bruise the serpent's head. We are not comfortless in confinement, for we have faith. We fear not affliction, for we have hope. And we forgive our enemies, for we have charity. Be not under apprehensions for us. We are happy in confinement through the promises of God, glory in our bonds, and exult in being thought worthy to suffer for the sake of Christ. We desire not to be released, but to be blessed with fortitude. We ask not liberty, but the power of perseverance. And wish for no change on our condition, but that which places a crown of martyrdom upon our heads. Scoblant was first brought to his trial, when persisting in the profession of his faith, he received the sentence of death. On his return to prison, he earnestly requested the jailer not to permit any friar to come near him, saying, quote, They can do me no good, but they may greatly disturb me. I hope my salvation is already sealed in heaven, and that the blood of Christ, in which I firmly put my trust, hath washed me from my iniquities. I am not going to throw off this mantle of clay, to be clad in robes of eternal glory, by whose celestial brightness I shall be freed from all errors. I hope I may be the last martyr to papal tyranny, and the blood already spilt found sufficient to quench the thirst of popish cruelty, that the Church of Christ may have rest here, as his servants will hereafter. 
On the day of execution he took a pathetic leave of his fellow prisoners. At the stake he fervently said the Lord's Prayer and sung the 40th Psalm. Then commending his soul to God, he was burnt alive. Hughes soon after died in prison, upon which occasion Cummins wrote thus to his friends, quote, I am now deprived of my friends and companions. Scoblant is martyred, and Hughes dead, by the visitation of the Lord. Yet I am not alone. I have with me the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. He is my comfort, and shall be my reward. Pray unto God to strengthen me to the end, as I expect every hour to be freed from this tenement of clay. End quote. On his trial he freely confessed himself of the reformed religion, answered with a manly fortitude to every charge against him, and proved the scriptural part of his answers from the gospel. The judge told him the only alternatives were recantation or death, and concluded by saying, quote, Will you die for the faith you profess? End quote. To which Cummins replied, quote, I am not only willing to die, but to suffer the most excruciating torments for it, after which my soul shall receive its confirmation from God himself in the midst of eternal glory. End quote. Being condemned, he went cheerfully to the place of execution, and died with the most manly fortitude and Christian resignation. William of Nassau fell a sacrifice to treachery, being assassinated in the fifty-first year of his age by Balthazar Gerard, a native of Ranche Comte, in the province of Burgundy. This murderer, in hopes of a reward here and hereafter, for killing an enemy to the king of Spain and an enemy to the Catholic religion, undertook to destroy the Prince of Orange. Having procured firearms, he watched him as he passed through the great hall of his palace to dinner, and demanded a passport. The Princess of Orange, observing that the assassin spoke with a hollow and confused voice, asked who he was, saying that she did not like his countenance. The prince answered that it was one that demanded a passport, which he should presently have. Nothing further passed before dinner, but on the return of the prince and princess through the same hall, after dinner was over, the assassin, standing concealed as much as possible by one of the pillars, fired at the prince, the balls entering at the left side and passing through the right, wounding in their passage the stomach and vital parts. On receiving the wounds, the prince only said, Lord have mercy upon my soul and upon these poor people, and then expired immediately. The lamentations throughout the United Provinces were general on account of the death of the Prince of Orange, and the assassin, who was immediately taken, received sentence to be put to death in the most exemplary manner, yet such was his enthusiasm, or folly, that when his flesh was torn by red-hot pinchers, he coolly said, If I was at liberty, I would commit such an action over again. The Prince of Orange's funeral was the grandest ever seen in the Low Countries, and perhaps the sorrow for his death the most sincere, as he left behind him the character he honestly deserved, viz., that of father of his people. To conclude, multitudes were murdered in different parts of Flanders. In the city of Valence in particular, fifty-seven of the principal inhabitants were butchered in one day, for refusing to embrace the Romish superstition, and great numbers were suffered to languish in confinement, until they perished through the inclemency of their dungeons. End of chapter 11. Recording by Tricia G. Chapter 12, Part 1 of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Father Ziley of Detroit. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1, by John Fox, edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 12, The Life and Story of the True Servant and Martyr of God, William Tyndale. Part 1. We have now to enter into the story of the good martyr of God, William Tyndale which William Tyndale, as he was a special organ of the Lord appointed, and as God's mattock to shake the inward roots and foundation of the Pope's proud prelacy, so the great prince of darkness, with his impious imps, having a special malice against him, left no way unsought how craftily to entrap him, and falsely to betray him, 
and maliciously to spill his life, as by the process of his story here following may appear. William Tyndale, the faithful minister of Christ, was born about the borders of Wales, and brought up from a child in the University of Oxford, where he, by long continuance, increased as well in the knowledge of tongues and other liberal arts, as especially in the knowledge of the Scriptures, whereunto his mind was singularly addicted, insomuch that he, lying then in Magdalen Hall, read privily to certain students and fellows of Magdalen College some parcel of divinity, instructing them in the knowledge and truth of the Scriptures. His manners and conversation, being correspondent to the same, were such that all they that knew him reputed him to be a man of most virtuous disposition and of life unspotted. Thus he, in the University of Oxford, increasing more and more in learning, and proceeding in degrees of the schools, spying his time, removed from thence to the University of Cambridge, where he likewise made his abode a certain space being now further ripened in the knowledge of God's word, leaving that university, he resorted to one Master Welch, a knight of Gloucestershire, and was there schoolmaster to his children, and in good favor with his master. As this gentleman kept a good ordinary commonly at his table, there resorted to him many times sundry abbots, deans, archdeacons, with diverse other doctors and great beneficed men who there, together with Master Tyndale, sitting at the same table, did use many times to enter communication, and talk of learned men, as of Luther and of Erasmus, also of divers other controversies and questions upon the Scripture. Then Master Tyndale, as he was learned and well practised in God's matters, spared not to show unto them simply and plainly his judgment, and when they at any time did vary from Tyndale in opinions, he would show them in the book, and lay plainly before them the open and manifest places of the Scriptures, to confute their errors, and confirm his sayings. And thus continued they for a certain season, reasoning and contending together diverse times, until at length they waxed weary, and bare a secret grudge in their hearts against him. As this grew on, the priests of the country, clustering together, began to grudge and storm against Tyndale railing against him in alehouses and other places, affirming that his sayings were heresy, and accused him secretly to the Chancellor and others of the bishop's officers. It followed not long after this that there was a sitting of the bishop's Chancellor appointed, and warning was given to the priests to appear, among whom Master Tyndale was also warned to be there, and whether he had any misdoubt by their threatenings or knowledge given him that they would lay some things to his charge, it is uncertain. But certain this is, as he himself declared, that he doubted their privy accusations, so that he, by the way, in going thitherwards, cried in his mind heartily to God to give him strength fast to stand in the truth of his word. When the time came for his appearance before the Chancellor, he threatened him grievously, reviling and rating him as though he had been a dog, and laid to his charge many things whereof no accuser could be brought forth, notwithstanding that the priests of the country were there present. Thus Master Tyndale, escaping out of their hands, departed home, and returned to his master again. There dwelt not far off a certain doctor that he had been chancellor to a bishop, who had been of old familiar acquaintance with Master Tyndale, and favoured him well, unto whom Master Tyndale went and opened his mind upon diverse questions of the Scripture, for to him he durst be bold to disclose his heart. Unto whom the doctor said, Do you not know that the Pope is very Antichrist, whom the Scriptures speak of? But beware that you say, for if you shall be perceived to be of that opinion, it will cost you your life. Not long after, Master Tyndale happened to be in the company of a certain divine, recounted for a learned man, and in communing and disputing with him, he drove him to that issue that the said great doctor burst out into these blasphemous words. We were better to be without God's laws than the Pope's. Master Tyndale, hearing this, 
full of godly zeal, and not bearing that blasphemous saying, replied, I defy the Pope and all his laws, and added, If God spared him life, ere many years he would cause a boy that driveth a plough to know more of the Scripture than he did. The grudge of the priests increasing still more and more against Tyndale, they never ceased barking and raiding at him, and laid many things sorely to his charge, saying that he was a heretic. Being so molested and vexed, he was constrained to leave that country, and to seek another place. And so, coming to Master Welch, he desired him of his good will that he might depart from him, saying, Sir, I perceive that I shall not be suffered to tarry long here in this country, neither shall you be able, though you would, to keep me out of the hands of the spirituality. What displeasure might grow to you by keeping me, God knoweth, for the which I should be right sorry. So that, in fine, Master Tyndale, with the good will of his master, departed, and Eftsoons came up to London, and there he preached a while, as he had done in the country. Bethinking himself of Cuthbert Tonstall, then Bishop of London, and especially of the great commendation of Erasmus, who in his annotations so extolleth the said Tonstall for his learning, Tyndale thus cast with himself that if he might attain unto his service, he were a happy man. Coming to Sir Henry Guilford, the king's comptroller, and bringing with him an oration of Isocrates, which he had translated out of Greek into English, he desired him to speak to the said Bishop of London for him, which he also did, and willed him moreover to write an epistle to the bishop, and to go himself with him. This he did, and delivered his epistle to a servant of his, named William Hebblethwaite, a man of his old acquaintance. But God, who secretly disposeth the course of things, saw that was not best for Tyndall's purpose, nor for the profit of his church, and therefore gave him to find little favor in the bishop's sight. The answer of whom was this, His house was full, he had more than he could well find, and he advised him to seek in London abroad, where he said he could lack no service. Being refused of the bishop, he came to Humphrey Mummoth, alderman of London, and besought him to help him, who the same time took him into his house, where the said Tyndall lived, as Mummoth said, like a good priest, studying both night and day. He would eat but sodden meat by his good will, nor drink but small single beer. He was never seen in the house to wear linen about him, all the space of his being there. And so remained Master Tyndale in London almost a year, marking with himself the courses of the world, and especially the demeanor of the preachers, how they boasted themselves and set up their authority, beholding also the pomp of the prelates, with other things more, which greatly misliked him, insomuch that he understood not only that there was no room in the bishop's house for him to translate the New Testament, but also that there was no place to do it in all England. Therefore, having by God's providence some aid ministered unto him by Humphrey Mummoth, and certain other good men, he took his leave of the realm, and departed into Germany, where the good man, being inflamed with the tender care and zeal of his country, refused no travail nor diligence, how, by all means possible, to reduce his brethren and countrymen of England, to the same taste and understanding of God's holy word and verity, which the Lord had endued him withal. Whereupon, considering in his mind, and conferring also with John Frith, Tyndale thought with himself no way more to conduce thereunto, than if the scripture were turned into the vulgar speech, that the poor people might read and see the simple plain word of God. He perceived that it was not possible to establish the lay people in any truth, except the scriptures were so plainly laid before their eyes in their mother tongue, that they might see the meaning of the text. For else whatsoever truth should be taught them, the enemies of the truth would quench it, either with reasons of sophistry and traditions of their own making, founded without all ground of scripture, or else juggling with the text, expounding it in such a sense as it were impossible to gather of the text, if the right meaning thereof were seen. Master Tyndall considered this only, or most chiefly, to be the cause of all mischief in the church, that the scriptures of God were hidden from the people's eyes. 
for so long the abominable doings and idolatries maintained by the pharisaical clergy could not be espied and therefore all their labor was with might and main to keep it down so that either it should not be read at all or if it were they would darken the right sense with the mist of their sophistry and so entangle those who rebuked or despised their abominations wresting the scripture into their own purpose contrary unto the meaning of the text they would so delude the unlearned lay people that though thou felt in thy heart and wert sure that all were false that they said yet couldst not solve their subtle riddles for these and such other considerations this good man was stirred up of god to translate the scripture into his mother tongue for the profit of the simple people of his country first setting in hand with the new testament which came forth in print about anno domini fifteen twenty five cuthbert tonstall bishop of london with sir thomas moore being sore aggrieved despised how to destroy that false erroneous translation as they called it it happened that one augustine packington a mercer was then at antwerp where the bishop was this man favored tyndall but showed the contrary unto the bishop the bishop being desirous to bring his purpose to pass communed how that he would gladly buy the new testaments packington hearing him say so said my lord i can do more in this matter than most merchants that be here if it be your pleasure for I know the Dutchmen and the strangers that have bought them of Tyndall, and have them here to sell, oh, so that, if it be your lordship's pleasure, I must disperse money to pay for them, or else I cannot have them, and so I will assure you to have every book of them that is printed and unsold. The bishop, thinking he had God by the toe, said, Do your diligence, gentle master Packington, get them for me, and I will pay whatsoever they cost for I intend to burn and destroy them all at St. Paul's cross. This Augustine Packington went unto William Tyndall, and declared the whole matter, and so upon the compact made between them, the Bishop of London had the books, Packington had the thanks, and Tyndale had the money. End of chapter 12, part 1, recording by Father Ziley, Detroit, Michigan. Chapter 12, Part 2 of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Father Ziley of Detroit. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1 by John Fox. Edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 12. THE LIFE AND STORY OF THE TRUE SERVANT AND MARTYR OF GOD, WILLIAM TYNDALL, PART Two. After this, Tyndall corrected the same New Testament again, and caused them to be newly imprinted, so that they came thick and threefold over into England. When the bishop perceived that, he sent for Packington, and said to him, How cometh this, that there are so many New Testaments abroad? You promised me that you would buy them all and answered Packington, Surely I bought all that were to be had, but I perceive they have printed more since. I see it will never be better so long as they have letters and stamps. Wherefore you were best to buy the stamps too, and so you shall be sure. At which answer the bishop smiled, and so the matter ended. In a short space after, it fortuned that George Constantine was apprehended by Sir Thomas More, who was then Chancellor of England, as suspected of certain heresies. Master Moore asked of him, saying, Constantine, I would have thee be plain with me in one thing that I will ask, and I promise thee I will show thee favor in all other things whereof thou art accused. There is beyond the sea Tyndall, Joy, and a great many of you, I know they cannot live without help. There are some that succor them with money, and thou, being one of them, hadst thy part thereof, and therefore knowest whence it came. I pray thee, tell me, who be they that help them thus? My lord, quoth Constantine, I will tell you truly, it is the bishop of London that hath holpen us, for he hath bestowed among us a great deal of money upon New Testaments to burn them, and that hath been, and yet is, 
our only succour and comfort. Now, by my troth, quoth Moore, I think even the same, for so much I told the bishop before he went about it. After that, Master Tyndall took in hand to translate the Old Testament, finishing the five books of Moses, with sundry most learned and godly prologues, most worthy to be read and read again by all good Christians. These books being sent over into England, it cannot be spoken what a door of light they opened to the eyes of the whole English nation, which before were shut up in darkness. At his first departing out of the realm, he took his journey into Germany, where he had conference with Luther and other learned men. After he had continued there a certain season, he came down into the Netherlands, and had his most abiding in the town of Antwerp. The godly books of Tyndall, and especially the New Testament of his translation, after that they began to come into men's hands, and to spread abroad, wrought great and singular profit to the godly. But the ungodly, envying and disdaining that the people should be anything wiser than they, and fearing lest by the shining beams of truth their works of darkness should be discerned, began to stir with no small ado. At what time Tyndall had translated Deuteronomy, minding to print the same at Hamburg, he sailed thitherward. Upon the coast of Holland he suffered shipwreck, by which he lost all his books, writings, and copies, his money and his time, and so was compelled to begin all again. He came in another ship to Hamburg, where, at his appointment, Master Coverdale tarried for him, and helped him in the translating of the whole five books of Moses, from Easter until December, in the house of a worshipful widow, Mistress Margaret Van Emerson, Anno Domini, 1529 a great sweating sickness being at the same time in the town. So, having dispatched his business at Hamburg, he returned to Antwerp. When God's will was that the New Testament in the common tongue should come abroad, Tyndall, the translator thereof, added to the latter end a certain epistle, wherein he desired them that were learned to amend, if aught were found amiss. Wherefore, if there had been any such default deserving correction, it had been the part of courtesy and gentleness, for men of knowledge and judgment to have showed their learning therein, and to have redressed what was to be amended. But the clergy, not willing to have that book prosper, cried out upon it that there were a thousand heresies in it, and that it was not to be corrected, but utterly to be suppressed. Some said it was not possible to translate the scriptures into English, some that it was not lawful for the lay people to have it in their mother tongue, some that it would make them all heretics, and to the intent to induce the temporal rulers unto their purpose, they said it would make the people to rebel against the king. All this Tyndall himself, in his prologue, before the first book of Moses, declareth, showing further what great pains were taken in examining that translation, and comparing it with their own imaginations, that with less labor, he supposeth, they might have translated a great part of the Bible, showing, moreover, that they scanned and examined every title and point in such sort, and so narrowly, that there was not one eye therein, but if it lacked a prick over his head, they did note it and numbered it unto the ignorant people for a heresy. So great were then the froward devices of the English clergy, who should have been the guides of light unto the people, to drive the people from knowledge of the scripture, which neither they would translate themselves, nor yet abide it to be translated of others, to the intent, as Tyndale saith, that the world being kept still in darkness, they might sit in the consciences of the people, through vain superstition and false doctrine, to satisfy their ambition and insatiable covetousness, and to exalt their own honor above king and emperor. The bishops and prelates never rested before they had brought the king to their consent, by reason whereof a proclamation in all haste was devised and sent forth under public authority that the testament of Tyndall's translation was inhibited, which was about Anno Domini 1537 and not content herewith, they proceeded further how to entangle him in their nets, and to bereave him of his life, which how they brought to pass, now it remaineth 
to be declared. In the registers of London it appeareth manifest how that the bishops and Sir Thomas More, having before them such as had been at Antwerp, most studiously would search and examine all things belonging to Tyndale, where and with whom he hosted, whereabout stood the house, what was his stature, in what apparel he went, what resort he had, all which things, when they had diligently learned, then began they to work their feats. William Tyndall, being in the town of Antwerp, had been lodged about one whole year, in the house of Thomas Points, an Englishman who kept a house of English merchants. Came thither one out of England, whose name was Henry Phillips, his father being customer of Poole, a comely fellow, like as he had been a gentleman, having a servant with him. But wherefore he came, or for what purpose he was sent thither, no man could tell. Master Tyndall, diverse times, was desired forth to dinner and support amongst merchants. By means whereof this Henry Phillips became acquainted with him, so that within short space Master Tyndall had a great confidence in him, and brought him to his lodging, to the house of Thomas Points, and had him also once or twice with him to dinner and supper, and further entered such friendship with him, that through his procurement he lay in the same house of the St. Points, to whom he showed, moreover, his books and other secrets of his study. So little did Tyndale then mistrust this traitor. But Points, having no great confidence in the fellow, asked Master Tyndale how he came acquainted with this Phillips. Master Tyndale answered that he was an honest man, handsomely learned, and very conformable. Points, perceiving that he bare such favor to him, said no more, thinking that he was brought acquainted with him by some friend of his. The said Phillips, being in the town three or four days, upon a time desired Points to walk with him forth of the town, to show him the commodities thereof, and in walking together without the town had communication of diverse things, and some of the king's affairs, by which talk Points as yet suspected nothing. But after... When the time was past, Points perceived this to be the mind of Phillips, to feel whether the said Points might, for lucre of money, help him to his purpose. For he perceived before that Phillips was moneyed, and would that Points should think no less. For he had desired Points before to help him to diverse things, and such things as he named he required might be of the best, for, said he, I have money enough. Phillips went from Antwerp to the court of Brussels, which is from thence twenty-four English miles, whence he brought with him to Antwerp the procurator-general, who is the emperor's attorney, with certain other officers. Within three or four days points went forth to the town of Baroy, being eighteen English miles from Antwerp, where he had business to do for the space of a month or six weeks, and in the time of his absence Henry Phillips came again to Antwerp, to the house of points, and coming in, spake with his wife, asking whether Master Tyndale were within. Then went he forth again, and set the officers whom he had brought with him from Brussels in the street, and about the door. About noon he came again, and went to Master Tyndale, and desired him to lend him forty shillings. For, said he, I lost my purse this morning coming over at the passage between this and Mechlin. So Master Tyndall took him forty shillings, which was easy to be had of him, if he had it, for in the wily subtleties of this world he was simple and inexpert. Then said Phillips, Master Tyndall, you shall be my guest here this day. No, said Master Tyndall, I go forth this day to dinner, and you shall go with me, and be my guest, where you shall be welcome. So when it was dinner-time, Master Tyndall went forth with Phillips, and at the going forth of Point's house was a long narrow entry, so that two could not go in front. Master Tyndall would have put Phillips before him, but Phillips would in no wise but put Master Tyndall before, for that he pretended to show great humanity. So Master Tyndall, being a man of great stature, went before, and Phillips, a tall, comely person, followed behind him, who had set officers on either side of the door upon two seats, who might see who came in the entry. 
Phillips pointed with his finger over Master Tyndall's head down to him, that the officers might see that it was he whom they should take. The officers afterwards told points, when they had laid him in prison, that they pitied to see his simplicity. They brought him to the emperor's attorney, where he dined. Then came the procurator-general to the house of points, and sent away all that was there of Master Tyndall's, as well as his books as other things, and from thence Tyndall was had to the castle of Vilvord, eighteen English miles from Antwerp. Master Tyndall, remaining in prison, was proffered an advocate and procurator, the which he refused, saying that he would make answer for himself. He had so preached to them who had him in charge, and such as was there conversant with him in the castle, that they reported of him, that if he were not a good Christian man, they knew not whom they might take to be one. At last, after much reasoning, when no reason would serve, although he deserved no death, he was condemned by virtue of the emperor's decree, made in the assembly at Augsburg. Brought forth to the place of execution, he was tied to the stake, strangled by the hangman, and afterwards consumed with fire in the town of Vilvord, Anno Domini, 1536, crying at the stake with a fervent zeal and a loud voice, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Such was the power of his doctrine, and the sincerity of his life, that during the time of his imprisonment, which endured a year and a half, he converted, it is said, his keeper, the keeper's daughter, and others of his household. As touching his translation of the New Testament, because his enemies did so much carp at it, pretending it to be full of heresies, he wrote to John Frith as followeth, I call God to record against the day we shall appear before our Lord Jesus, that I never altered one syllable of God's word against my conscience, nor would do this day if all that is in earth, whether it be honor, pleasure, or riches, might be given me. End of chapter 12 Recording by Father Ziley of Detroit Vigil of Pentecost, 2009《ハクス・ボック・オブ・マーターズ》Book of Martyrs, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean F. Sawyers.《ハクス・ボック・オブ・マーターズ》Volume 1 by John Fox. Edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 13 An Account of the Life of John Calvin. This reformer was born at Noyon in Picardy, July 10, 1509. He was instructed in grammar, learning at Paris under Martyrinus Corderius, and studied philosophy in the College of Montaigne under a Spanish professor. His father, who discovered many marks of his early piety, particularly in his reprehensions of the vices of his companions, designed him at first for the church, and got him presented May 21, 1521, to the chapel of Notre Dame de la Gassine in the church of Noyon. In 1527 he was presented to the rectory of Marseilleville, which he exchanged in 1529 for the rectory of Pointe la Evaque near Noyon. His father afterward changed his resolution and would have him study law, to which Calvin, who by reading the scriptures had conceived a dislike to the superstitions of popery, readily consented and resigned to the chapel of Gassine and the rectory of Pointe la Evaque in 1534. He made great progress in that science, and improved no less in the knowledge of divinity by his private studies. At Bourges he applied to the Greek tongue under the direction of Professor Volmar. His father's death having called him back to Noyon, he stayed there a short time, and then went to Paris, where a speech of Nicholas Copp, rector of the University of Paris, of which Calvin furnished the materials, having greatly displeased the Sorbonne and the Parliament, gave rise to a persecution against the Protestants, and Calvin, who narrowly escaped being taken into the College of Fort Tourette, was forced to retire to Zaintongue, after having had the honor to be introduced to the Queen of Navarre, who had raised this first storm against the Protestants. Calvin returned to Paris in 1534. 
This year the reformed met with severe treatment, which determined him to leave France, after publishing a treatise against those who believed that departed souls are in a kind of sleep. He retired to Basel, where he studied Hebrew. At this time he published his Institutions of the Christian Religion, a work well adapted to spread his fame, though he himself was desirous of living in obscurity. It is dedicated to the French king Francis I. Calvin next wrote an apology for the Protestants who were burnt for their religion in France. After the publication of this work, Calvin went to Italy to pay a visit to the Duchess of Ferrara, a lady of eminent piety, by whom he was very kindly received. From Italy he came back to France, and having settled his private affairs, he proposed to go to Strasbourg or Basel in company with his sole surviving brother, Antony Calvin. But as the roads were not safe on account of the war, except for the Duke of Savoy's territories, he chose that road. This was a particular direction of providence, says Bailey. It was his destiny that he should settle at Geneva, and when he was wholly intent upon going farther, he found himself detained by an order from heaven, if I may so speak. At Geneva, Calvin therefore was obliged to comply with the choice which the consistory and magistrates made of him, with the consent of the people to be one of their ministers and professor of divinity. He wanted to undertake only this last office and not the other, but in the end he was obliged to take both upon him, in August 1536. The year following, he made all the people declare, upon oath, their assent to the confession of faith, which contained a renunciation of popery. He next intimated that he could not submit to a regulation which the canton of Bern had lately made, whereupon the syndics of Geneva summoned an assembly of the people, and it was ordered that Calvin, Farrell, and another minister should leave the town in a few days, for refusing to administer the sacrament. Calvin retired to Strasbourg, and established a French church in that city, of which he was the first minister. He was also appointed to be professor of divinity there. Meanwhile the people of Geneva entreated him so earnestly to return to them, that at last he consented, and arrived September 13, 1541, to the great satisfaction both of the people and the magistrates, and the first thing he did after his arrival was to establish a form of church discipline and a consistorial jurisdiction, invested with power of inflicting censures and canonical punishments, as far as excommunication, inclusively. It has long been the delight of both infidels and some professed Christians, when they wish to bring odium upon the opinions of Calvin, to refer to his agency in the death of Michael Servetus. This action is used on all occasions by those who have been unable to overthrow his opinions, as a conclusive argument against his whole system. Calvin burnt Servetus, Calvin burnt Servetus, is a good proof with a certain class of reasoners that the doctrine of the Trinity is not true, that divine sovereignty is anti-scriptural, and Christianity is a cheat. We have no wish to palliate any act of Calvin's which is manifestly wrong. All his proceedings in relation to the unhappy affair of Servetus, we think, cannot be defended. Still, it should be remembered that the true principles of religious toleration were very little understood in the time of Calvin. All the other reformers then living approved of Calvin's conduct. Even the gentle and amiable Melanchthon expressed himself in relation to this affair in the following manner. In a letter addressed to Bullinger, he says, I have read your statement respecting the blasphemy of Servetus, and praise your piety and judgment, and am persuaded that the Council of Geneva has done right in putting to death this obstinate man, who would never have ceased his blasphemies. I am astonished that any one can be found to disapprove of this proceeding. Farrell expressly says that Servetus deserved a capital punishment. Bucer did not hesitate to declare that Servetus deserved something worse than death. The truth is, although Calvin had some hand in the arrest and imprisonment of Servetus, he was unwilling that he should be burnt at all. I desire, says he, that the severity of the punishment should be remitted. We endeavored to commute the kind of death, but in vain. By wishing to mitigate the severity of the punishment, says Farrell to Calvin, you discharge the office of a friend towards your greatest enemy. That Calvin was the instigator of the magistrates that Servetus might be burned, says Turretin, 
historians neither anywhere affirm nor does it appear from any considerations nay it is certain that he with the college of pastors dissuaded from that kind of punishment it has been often asserted that calvin possessed so much influence with the magistrates of geneva that he might have obtained the release of servetus had he not been desirous of his destruction this however is not true so far from it that calvin was himself once banished from geneva by these very magistrates and often opposed their arbitrary measures in vain so little desirous was calvin of procuring the death of servetus that he warned him of his danger and suffered him to remain several weeks at geneva before he was arrested but this language which was then accounted blasphemous was the cause of his imprisonment when in prison calvin visited him and used every argument to persuade him to retract his horrible blasphemies without reference to his peculiar sentiments this was the extent of calvin's agency in this unhappy affair it cannot however be denied that in this instance calvin acted contrary to the benignant spirit of the gospel it is better to drop a tear over the inconsistency of human nature and to bewail those infirmities which cannot be justified he declared he acted conscientiously and publicly justified the act it was the opinion that erroneous religious principles are punishable by the civil magistrate that did the mischief whether at geneva in transylvania or in britain and to this rather than to trinitarianism or unitarianism it ought to be imputed after the death of luther calvin exerted great sway over the men of that notable period he was influential in france italy germany holland england and scotland two thousand one hundred and fifty reformed congregations were organized receiving from him their preachers calvin triumphant over all his enemies felt his death drawing near yet he continued to exert himself in every way with youthful energy when about to lie down and rest he drew up his will saying i do testify that i live and purpose to die in this faith which god has given me through his gospel and that i have no other dependence for salvation than the free choice which is made of me by him with my whole heart i embrace his mercy through which all my sins are covered for christ's sake and for the sake of his death and sufferings according to the measure of grace granted unto me i have taught this pure simple word by sermons by deeds and by expositions of this scripture in all my battles with the enemies of the truth i have not used sophistry but have fought the good fight squarely and directly may twenty seventh fifteen sixty four was the day of his release and blessed journey home he was in his fifty-fifth year that a man who had acquired so great a reputation and such an authority should have had but a salary of one hundred crowns and refused to accept more and after living fifty-five years with the utmost frugality should leave but three hundred crowns to his heirs including the value of his library which sold very dear is something so heroical that one must have lost all feeling not to admire when calvin took his leave of strasburg to return to geneva they wanted to continue him the privileges of a freeman of their town and the revenues of a prebend which had been assigned to him the former he accepted but absolutely refused the other he carried one of the brothers with him to geneva but he never took any pains to get him preferred to an honorable post as any other possessed of his credit would have done he took care indeed of the honor of his brother's family by getting him freed from an adulteress and obtaining leave to him to marry again but even his enemies relate that he had made him learn the trade of a bookbinder which he followed all his life after calvin as a friend of civil liberty the rev dr weisner in his late discourse at plymouth on the anniversary of the landing of the pilgrims made the following assertion much as the name of calvin has been scoffed at and loaded with reproach by many sons of freedom there is not an historical proposition more susceptible of complete demonstration than this that no man has lived to whom the whole world is under greater obligations for the freedom it now enjoys than john calvin end of chapter thirteen recording by sean f sawyers o'fallon missouri
Chapter 14 of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tricia G. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1 by John Fox. Edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 14 An Account of the Persecutions in Great Britain and Ireland prior to the reign of Queen Mary I. Gildas, the most ancient British writer extant, who lived about the time that the Saxons left the island of Great Britain, has drawn a most shocking instance of the barbarity of those people. The Saxons, on their arrival, being heathens like the Scots and Picts, destroyed the churches and murdered the clergy wherever they came. But they could not destroy Christianity, for those who would not submit to the Saxon yoke went and resided beyond the Severn. Neither have we the names of those Christian sufferers transmitted to us, especially those of the clergy. The most dreadful instance of barbarity under the Saxon government was the massacre of the monks of Bangor, A.D. 586. These monks were in all respects different from those men who bear the same name at present. In the 8th century, the Danes, a roving crew of barbarians, landed in different parts of Britain, both in England and Scotland. At first they were repulsed, but in A.D. 857, a party of them landed somewhere near Southampton, and not only robbed the people, but burned down the churches, and murdered the clergy. In A.D. 868, these barbarians penetrated into the center of England and took up their quarters at Nottingham. But the English, under their king, Ethelred, drove them from their posts and obligated them to retire to Northumberland. In 870, another body of these barbarians landed at Norfolk and engaged in battle with the English at Hertford. Victory declared in favor of the pagans, who took Edmund, king of the East Angles, prisoner, and after treating him with a thousand indignities, transfixed his body with arrows, and then beheaded him. In Fifeshire, in Scotland, they burned many of the churches, and among the rest that belonging to the Chaldees at St. Andrews. The piety of these men made them objects of abhorrence to the Danes, who, wherever they went, singled out the Christian priests for destruction, of whom no less than two hundred were massacred in Scotland. It was much the same in that part of Ireland now called Leinster, where the Danes murdered and burned the priests alive in their own churches. They carried destruction along with them wherever they went, sparing neither age nor sex, but the clergy were the most obnoxious to them because they ridiculed their idolatry and persuaded their people to have nothing to do with them. In the reign of Edward III, the Church of England was extremely corrupted with errors and superstition and the light of the gospel of Christ was greatly eclipsed and darkened with human inventions, burdensome ceremonies, and gross idolatry. The followers of Wycliffe, then called Lollards, were become extremely numerous, and the clergy were so vexed to see them increase. Whatever power or influence they might have to molest them in an underhand manner, they had no authority by law to put them to death. However, the clergy embraced the favorable opportunity and prevailed upon the king to suffer a bill to be brought into Parliament, by which all Lollards who remained obstinate should be delivered over to the secular power and burnt as heretics. This act was the first in Britain for the burning of people for their religious sentiments. It passed in the year 1401, and was soon after put into execution. The first person who suffered in consequence of this cruel act was William Santry, or Sawtry, a priest, who was burnt to death in Smithfield. Soon after this, Sir John Oldcastle, Lord Cobham, in consequence of his attachment to the doctrines of Wycliffe, was accused of heresy, and being condemned to be hanged and burnt, was accordingly executed in Lincoln's Inn Fields, A.D. 1419. In his written defense, Lord Cobham said, quote, As for images, I understand that they be not of belief, but that they were ordained since the belief of Christ was given by sufferance of the church to represent and bring to mind the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ and martyrdom and good living of other saints, and that whoso it be that doth the worship to dead images that is due to God 
or putteth such hope or trust in help of them, as he should do to God, or hath affection in one more than in another, he doth in that the greatest sin of idol worship. Also I suppose this fully, that every man in this earth is a pilgrim toward bliss, or toward pain, and that he that knoweth not, we will not know, we keep the holy commandments of God in his living here, albeit that he go on pilgrimages to all the world, and he die so, he shall be damned. He that knoweth the holy commandments of God, and keepeth them to his end, he shall be saved, though he never in his life go on pilgrimage, as men now use, to Canterbury, or to Rome, or to any other place. End quote. Upon the day appointed, Lord Cobham was brought out of the tower with his arms bound behind him, having a very cheerful countenance. Then he was laid upon a hurdle, as though he had been a most heinous traitor to the crown, and so drawn forth into St. Giles's field. As he was come to the place of execution, and was taken from the hurdle, he fell down devoutly upon his knees, desiring Almighty God to forgive his enemies. Then stood he up and beheld the multitude, exhorting them in most godly manner to follow the laws of God written in the scriptures, and to beware of such teachers as they see contrary to Christ in their conversation and living. Then he was hanged up by the middle in chains of iron, and so consumed alive in the fire, praising the name of God, so long as his life lasted. The people there present showing great dolor. And this was done A.D. 1418. How the priests that time fared, blasphemed and accursed, requiring the people not to pray for him, but to judge him damned in hell, for that he departed not in the obedience of their pope, it were too long to write. Thus resteth this valiant Christian knight, Sir John Oldcastle, under the altar of God, which is Jesus Christ, among that godly company who, in the kingdom of patience, suffered great tribulation with the death of their bodies for his faithful word and testimony. In August 1473, one Thomas Granter was apprehended in London. He was accused of professing the doctrines of Wycliffe, for which he was condemned as an obstinate heretic. This pious man, being brought to the sheriff's house, on the morning of the day appointed for his execution, desired a little refreshment, and having ate some, he said to the people present, I eat now a very good meal, for I have a strange conflict to engage with before I go to supper. And having eaten, he returned thanks to God for the bounties of his all-gracious providence, requesting that he might be instantly led to the place of execution, to bear testimony to the truth of those principles which he had professed. Accordingly, he was chained to a stake on Tower Hill, where he was burnt alive, professing the truth with his last breath. In the year 1499, one Badrum, a pious man, was brought before the Bishop of Norwich, having been accused by some of the priests, withholding the doctrines of Wycliffe. He confessed he did believe everything that was objected against him. For this, he was condemned as an obstinate heretic, and a warrant was granted for his execution. Accordingly, he was brought to the stake at Norwich, where he suffered with great constancy. In 1506, one William Tilfrey, a pious man, was burnt alive at Amersham, in a close called Stony Pratt, and at the same time his daughter, Joan Clark, a married woman, was obliged to light the faggots that were to burn her father. This year also one Father Roberts, a priest, was convicted of being a Lollard before the Bishop of Lincoln, and burnt alive at Buckingham. In 1507, one Thomas Norris was burnt alive for the testimony of the truth of the gospel at Norwich. This man was a poor, inoffensive, harmless person, but his parish priest, conversing with him one day, conjectured he was a Lollard. In consequence of this supposition, he gave information to the bishop, and Norris was apprehended. In 1508, one Lawrence Gual, who had been kept in prison two years, was burnt alive at Salisbury for denying the real presence in the sacrament. It appeared that this man kept a shop in Salisbury and entertained some lollards in his house, for which he was informed against to the bishop, but he abode by his first testimony and was condemned to suffer as a heretic. A pious woman was burnt at Chippen Sudburn, 
by order of the Chancellor, Dr. Whittenham. After she had been consumed in the flames and the people were returning home, a bull broke loose from a butcher, and singling out the Chancellor from all the rest of the company, he gored him through the body, and on his horns carried his entrails. This was seen by all the people, and it is remarkable that the animal did not meddle with any other person whatever. October 18, 1511, William Suckling and John Bannister, who had formerly recanted, returned again to the profession of the faith, and were burnt alive in Smithfield. In the year 1517, one John Brown, who had recanted before in the reign of Henry the Seventh and borne a faggot round St. Paul's, was condemned by Dr. Wonaman, Archbishop of Canterbury, and burnt alive at Ashford. Before he was chained to the stake, the Archbishop Wonaman and Yester, Bishop of Rochester, caused his feet to be burnt in a fire until all the flesh came off, even to the bones. This was done in order to make him again recant, but he persisted in his attachment to the truth to the last. Much about this time one Richard Hun, a merchant tailor in the city of London, was apprehended, having refused to pay the priest his fees for the funeral of a child, and being conveyed to the Lollard's Tower in the palace of Lambeth, was there privately murdered by some of the servants of the archbishop. September 24, 1518, John Stillinson, who had before recanted, was apprehended, brought before Richard Fitzjames, Bishop of London, and on the 25th of October was condemned as a heretic. He was chained to the stake in Smithfield amidst a vast crowd of spectators, and sealed his testimony to the truth with his blood. He declared that he was a Lollard, and that he had always believed the opinions of Wycliffe, and although he had been weak enough to recant his opinions, yet he was now willing to convince the world that he was ready to die for the truth. In the year 1519, Thomas Mann was burnt in London, as was one Robert Sellin, a plain honest man, for speaking against image worship and pilgrimages. Much about this time was executed in Smithfield, in London, James Brewster, a native of Colchester. His sentiments were the same as the rest of the Lollards, or those who followed the doctrines of Wycliffe. But notwithstanding the innocence of his life, and the regularity of his manners, he was obliged to submit to papal revenge. During this year, one Christopher, a shoemaker, was burnt alive at Newbury, in Berkshire, for denying those popish articles which we have already mentioned. This man had gotten some books in English, which were sufficient to render him obnoxious to the Romish clergy. Robert Silks, who had been condemned in the bishop's court as a heretic, made his escape out of prison, but was taken two years afterward, and brought back to Coventry where he was burnt alive. The sheriffs always seized the goods of the martyrs for their own use, so that their wives and children were left to starve. In 1532, Thomas Harding, who with his wife had been accused of heresy, was brought before the Bishop of Lincoln, and condemned for denying the real presence in the sacrament. He was then chained to a stake, erected for the purpose, at Chesham in the Pell, near Botley. And when they had set fire to the faggots, one of the spectators dashed out his brains with a billet. The priests told the people that whoever brought faggots to burn heretics would have an indulgence to commit sins for forty days. During the latter end of this year, Warham, Archbishop of Canterbury, apprehended one Hitton, a priest at Maidstone. And after he had been long tortured in prison, and several times examined by the Archbishop and Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, he was condemned as a heretic, and burnt alive before the door of his own parish church. Thomas Bilney, Professor of Civil Law at Cambridge, was brought before the Bishop of London and several other bishops, in the chapter house, Westminster, and being several times threatened with the stake and flames, he was weak enough to recant, but he repented severely afterward. For this he was brought before the bishop a second time, and condemned to death. Before he went to the stake, he confessed his adherence to those opinions which Luther held, and, when at it, he smiled and said, I have had many storms in this world, but now my vessel will soon be on shore in heaven. He stood unmoved in the flames, crying out, Jesus, I believe, and these were the last words he was heard to utter. 
A few weeks after Bilney had suffered, Richard Byfield was cast into prison, and endured some whipping, for his adherence to the doctrines of Luther. This Mr. Byfield had been some time a monk at Barnes in Surrey, but was converted by reading Tyndale's version of the New Testament. The sufferings this man underwent for the truth were so great that it would require a volume to contain them. Sometimes he was shut up in a dungeon, where he was almost suffocated by the offensive and horrid smell of filth and stagnant water. At other times he was tied up by the arms, until almost all his joints were dislocated. He was whipped at the post several times, until scarcely any flesh was left on his back, and all this was done to make him recant. He was then taken to the Lollard's Tower in Lambeth Palace, where he was chained by the neck to the wall, and once every day beaten in the most cruel manner by the archbishop's servants. At last he was condemned, degraded, and burnt in Smithfield. The next person that suffered was John Tewkesbury. This was a plain, simple man, who had been guilty of no other offense against what was called the Holy Mother Church than that of reading Tyndale's translation of the New Testament. At first he was weak enough to adjure, but afterward repented, and acknowledged the truth. For this he was brought before the Bishop of London, who condemned him as an obstinate heretic. He suffered greatly during the time of his imprisonment, so that when they brought him out to execution he was almost dead. He was conducted to the stake in Smithfield, where he was burned, declaring his utter abhorrence of popery, and professing a firm belief that his cause was just in the sight of God. The next person that suffered in this reign was James Bainham, a reputable citizen in London, who had married the widow of a gentleman in the temple. When chained to the stake, he embraced the faggots and said, O ye papists, behold, ye look for miracles, here now may you see a miracle, for in this fire I feel no more pain than if I were in bed, for it is as sweet to me as a bed of roses. Thus he resigned his soul into the hands of his Redeemer. Soon after the death of this martyr, one Traxnell, an inoffensive countryman, was burned alive at Bradford in Wiltshire, because he would not acknowledge the real presence in the sacrament, nor own the papal supremacy over the consciences of men. In the year 1533, John Frith, a noted martyr, died for the truth. When brought to the stake in Smithfield, he embraced the faggots, and exhorted a young man named Andrew Hewitt, who suffered with him, to trust his soul to that God who had redeemed it. Both these sufferers endured much torment, for the wind blew the flames away from them, so that they were above two hours in agony before they expired. In the year 1538, one Collins, a madman, suffered death with his dog in Smithfield. The circumstances were as follows. Collins happened to be in church when the priest elevated the host and Collins, in derision of the sacrifice of the mass, lifted up his dog above his head. For this crime, Collins, who ought to have been sent to a madhouse, or whipped at the cart's tail, was brought before the Bishop of London, and although he was really mad, yet such was the force of popish power, such the corruption in church and state, that the poor madman and his dog were both carried to the stake in Smithfield, where they were burned to ashes, amidst a vast crowd of spectators. There were some other persons who suffered the same year, of whom we shall take notice in the order they lie before us. One Cowbridge suffered at Oxford, and although he was reputed to be a madman, yet he showed great signs of piety when he was fastened to the stake, and after the flames were kindled around him. About the same time, one Perderv was put to death for saying privately to a priest, after he had drunk the wine, he blessed the hungry people with the empty chalice. At the same time was condemned William Letton, a monk of great age, in the county of Suffolk, who was burned at Norwich for speaking against an idol that was carried in procession, and for asserting that the sacrament should be administered in both kinds. Some time before the burning of these men, Nicholas Peak was executed at Norwich, and when the fire was lighted, he was so scorched that he was as black as pitch. Dr. Redding, standing before him, with Dr. Hearn and Dr. Spragwell, having a long white wand in his hand, struck him upon the right shoulder and said, Peak, recant and believe in the sacrament. To this he answered, 
I despise thee and it also, and with great violence he spit blood, occasioned by the anguish of his sufferings. Dr. Redding granted forty days' indulgence for the sufferer, in order that he might recant his opinions. But he persisted in his adherence to the truth, without paying any regard to the malice of his enemies, and he was burned alive, rejoicing that Christ had counted him worthy to suffer for his name's sake. On July 28, 1540, or 1541, for the chronology differs, Thomas Cromwell, Earl of Essex, was brought to a scaffold on Tower Hill, where he was executed with some striking instances of cruelty. He made a short speech to the people, and then meekly resigned himself to the axe. It is, we think, with great propriety, that this nobleman is ranked among the martyrs, for although the accusations preferred against him, did not relate to anything in religion, yet had it not been for his zeal to demolish popery, he might have to the last retained the king's favor. To this may be added, that the papists plotted his destruction, for he did more towards promoting the reformation than any man in that age, except the good Dr. Cranmer. Soon after the execution of Cromwell, Dr. Cuthbert Barnes, Thomas Garnett, and William Jerome, were brought before the ecclesiastical court of the Bishop of London, and accused of heresy. Being before the Bishop of London, Dr. Barnes was asked whether the saints prayed for us. To this he answered that, quote, He would leave that to God, but, said he, I will pray for you. End quote. On the 13th of July, 1541, these men were brought from the tower to Smithfield, where they were all chained to one stake and there suffered death with a constancy that nothing less than a firm faith in Jesus Christ could inspire. One Thomas Summers, an honest merchant, with three others, was thrown into prison for reading some of Luther's books, and they were condemned to carry those books to a fire in Cheapside. There they were to throw them in the flames. But Summers threw his over, for which he was sent back to the tower, where he was stoned to death. Dreadful persecutions were at this time carried on at Lincoln under Dr. Longland, the bishop of that diocese. At Buckingham, Thomas Baynard and James Morton, the one for reading the Lord's Prayer in English and the other for reading St. James' Epistles in English, were both condemned and burnt alive. Anthony Parsons, a priest, together with two others, was sent to Windsor to be examined concerning heresy, and several articles were tendered to them to subscribe, which they refused. This was carried on by the Bishop of Salisbury, who was the most violent persecutor of any in that age except Bonner. When they were brought to the stake, Parsons asked for some drink, which being brought him, he drank to his fellow sufferers, saying, Be merry, my brethren, and lift up your hearts to God, for after this sharp breakfast I trust we shall have a good dinner in the kingdom of Christ our Lord and Redeemer." At these words Eastwood, one of the sufferers, lifted up his eyes and hands to heaven, desiring the Lord above to receive his spirit. Parsons pulled the straw near to him, and then said to the spectators, This is God's armor, and now I am a Christian soldier prepared for battle. I look for no mercy but through the merits of Christ. He is my only Savior, in him do I trust for salvation." and soon after the fires were lighted, which burned their bodies, but could not hurt their precious and immortal souls. Their constancy triumphed over cruelty, and their sufferings will be held in everlasting remembrance. Thus were Christ's people betrayed every way, and their lives bought and sold. For, in the said Parliament, the king made this most blasphemous and cruel act to be a law for ever, that whatsoever they were that should read the scriptures in the mother tongue, which was then called Wycliffe's learning, they should forfeit land, cattle, body, life, and goods from their heirs for ever, and so be condemned for heretics to God, enemies to the crown, and most errant traitors to the land. End of chapter 14 End of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1, edited by William Byron Forbush